just take a moment before the cross just to acknowledge in our own hearts how much he loves us that despite all the pain and all of the suffering he thought us worth it Lord Jesus, thank you. Amen. That was great. Thanks, guys. Really appreciate it. Guys and girls. Okay, I can't resist this. I have to do a mini survey. Um, Who gives their cars names? This is a hand up, hand down job. I know my daughter does, and I now know that Dedo does. Any other name? Laura at the back. And Julia. We have a few namers of cars. I'm afraid to say I'm in the non-namers of cars. I might kind of swear at it occasionally. No. Um, Or is that the other drivers? No, sorry. Um, We're um, we're beginning a a, a kind of a series in the route to Easter today um, from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Um, And I just thought I'd just begin with a little bit of background to why we've chosen to do that and about the book itself. Feeling under a little bit of pressure because I've walked in and Mark Gabriel said to me, you're preaching on my favourite passage today. I mean, there is no pressure, of course, is there, Mark? Sitting there, please tell me you haven't got the note, he's got the Bible open and the notebook out. Okay, (laughs) that is seriously worrying, but never mind. Um, Ephesus was a really significant city um, in the ancient world. It was situated in what would have been called Asia Minor, it's now what we would call Turkey. Um, it was one of the most important cities in the Roman Empire. Um, it also played a very significant part in Paul's own ministry. It was like the cultural centre for the region. Uh, and Paul was based there for three years of his ministry. And he kind of used it as a mission base to reach out to the city, but also to the kind of surrounding communities um, around it. So it's a place that has political and economic significance. It's also a place that has significance in Paul's life and Paul's ministry and in the growth um, of the early church. Um, and, and this raises some, I think, some interesting issues when we approach this letter. Um, Because if you are writing to a place you've lived for three years and lived with people for three years, you would expect that letter to be peppered with personal references. And that's often the case in Paul's letters. If you read lots of them, you kind of, there's a whole lot of, and this person's doing okay. This person's having a really tough time. And how are you guys doing? And please pass my greetings on to this person. And that's a lot of what happened. There's the, the meat in Paul's letters. But you get a lot of that personal stuff. And there's only one name mentioned, Titius, the guy that I think's probably taken the letter to them. It's kind of strange. It's really lacking in personal references. It's one of the things that's caused people just to question the authorship. Did Paul really write this? Because it's kind of different to what you would expect and it's different to some of his other books. And that's the next thing. That what this book does is completely different to what most of Paul's letters are about. Sadly, kind of, I'm not sure Paul would necessarily be on my Christmas card list. Well, he might be on my Christmas card list, but I would always be worried if I got a letter through my letterbox and I recognised Paul's handwriting on it. Because most of the time, when Paul writes a letter to a church, he writes a letter to a church because there are some problems there. And those letters are about correcting error and trying to kind of rescue that congregation or church or community from kind of going in the wrong direction. They're about correction. Um, And this letter doesn't address any of those significant issues. Uh, And that's kind of interesting. Uh, So why this letter? Um, And what it appears to be, although it's addressed to Ephesus... It appears to be actually a circular letter which may have been written to a number of different churches. It's the one to Ephesus that kind of we've got, that we still have. And possibly it was carried by this guy, Titius, 
the only person that gets the personal mention. He may have taken it to different churches as kind of Paul's emissary. And it isn't about error. It's not, a, it's not a specific letter to a specific church. It's like a letter to the whole of the church and was probably addressed to lots of different churches, not just to Ephesus. It's not about correcting error, but significantly, I think, and why kind of, I want to spend time in it this term, it's actually written to remind his hearers of the significance of the church. And I think that makes it um, a letter for our time. Um, because we live in a time when well, our whole world has changed, hasn't it, if we're honest? You know, everything about the life that we've you know, lived and experienced, whether it's long or short, has changed in the last couple of years. I was chatting to a retired clergyman this week and he kind of said to me, boy, I'm just so glad I retired before COVID. You know, um, I don't envy you. And actually... I, I just find that interesting. I mean, I, I, you know, please don't get me wrong. The, these last couple of years have been some of the most challenging years I've known in ministry. Um, and it was really challenging when we were locked down, when we had to discover how to do things online and all of that side of it, um, when we had to try and find ways of keeping in contact with people we didn't see at all. Um, that was really hard. All of that was hard. I actually think... Because we're not in lockdown now, but we still have COVID. Um, but kind of, kind of the messages we get are really quite strange. We were talking about this in the walk on the way down here. You know, they're going to stop lateral flows. What? What is all that about? Uh, or stop them being free? Uh, you know, I mean, I, I don't get what the, the decisions that are being made at this time. I have to say, I find ministry now in this kind of in-between world, when it is not locked down, but neither is it back to normal, I actually think this is almost more challenging. When, you know, it's almost easier when it's one thing or it's the other thing. It feels like we're living in a no-man's land. I'm, I don't know if I'm alone in that or whether that kind of rings bells for you um, and for your experience. Um, and that has huge implications on church, doesn't it? You just have to look around the room to see that that has implications on church. You know, there, there's a whole stack of chairs at the back that are not out, that would have been out. There's a whole lot less of us here today than there would be. Some people are listening to us online that would never have done that before. You know, the world in which we live um, has changed and church, is, church, just as like every other institution in our society, hearing about schools from Katie earlier, touches every aspect of life. It touches Carol's life in the health service. It touches your life wherever you work, probably. And, you know, um, and so church has been touched by that. Um, and it isn't just that we have to wear masks or socially distance or we have cameras now um, and that people join us online. Um, but it, it's a deeper thing than that. And we kind of know the theological stuff, don't we? We know that church um, is not just about a building. It's not just about services. Although there is something really precious about worshipping together. You know, I mean, I just and, and, and there's something really precious that in those moments of worship, you know, God creeps up and catches you out. You know, he did to me this morning. You know, we were worshipping and just suddenly, oh Lord, this is it just, this is just good. You're, you're here, Lord. This is good. Um, and kind of, you know, and if you're sitting at home and you feel like you can't be here, probably that's hugely frustrating that you can't feel that you can be part of that. If you are here, I'm sure I am not all al alone in finding you kind of worship happens in your head, not just necessarily on your lips, or it happens in your heart. Perhaps that's a better way to put it. But it's flipping frustrating when you've got a mask on your face, isn't it? You know? You know, it's not. Yeah, you know, it's it's hard. Um, it's, church isn't about the building or the services. At the heart of it is about people. It's about relationship. It's about a body of people who have literally become Jesus's body on this planet. That He lives in us by His Spirit. That He is revealed in the actions, like we heard about at the larder, and you know, in our day-to-day -day lives with the people we meet and we spend. You know, people. You know, we're His representatives, and church is that collectively. 
You know, we're, that's what we're about. We're a body of people that become Jesus' body um, and, and stand in his place and that he touches others through. And, re- and at the heart of that is relationship. And the relationship is the hardest thing. You know, even if you're in the building, we're saying to you, please socially distance. You know, please leave the building and freeze after death so you can still talk to your friends. Uh, and it breaks down contact and it breaks down relationship. And there are many of you that are listening to me today and thinking, I wish I was in the building. You know, I wish I could be there. But I don't feel safe to be there. Or if I feel if I do come, it won't feel right because it feels all wrong. Do you get what I mean? I hope you do. Uh, I think the first thing I want you to know is that whatever you are feeling, and I, you know, and I suspect it is different for every one of us, whether we are in the room, whether we are watching online, or whether we will watch it later, is that it is, it is different for every one of us. And I can't really fully understand what you're feeling any more than you can fully understand what I'm feeling. But what I do know is that none of us are alone in this. Um, that what we are experiencing at church, we've had people leave, we've had people that have not come back, we have some of you that are online and don't feel able to come here. There there have been a multitude of different things that have happened in our lives that have made us different to what we were two years ago as a church. It isn't just about numbers in a building, it's a deeper thing than that. What I do know is that none of us are alone in what we're experiencing in that. I talk to church leaders in Tunbridge Wells, and it is the same story in every church. It is the same story when one looks at all of the research that people like the Evangelical Alliance and the Church of England do into kind of what is happening across the church nationally. You know, what we're experiencing um, is, is just a mirror of what is being replicated across the nation. And that is, um, you know, that is incredibly challenging. Somehow we have to make sense of how do we do church in this, in this time. And we've talked about that before and we will have to keep talking about that. That's why Ephesians is helpful because it reminds us about what is so important. You see, I think even if I had a magic wand and you know I've always wished for a magic wand. If anyone comes up with it, please do let me have it as soon as possible, as soon as it is marketed. You know, that magic wand that puts everything right for everybody. You know, if we had a magic wand that meant that kind of Omicron or whatever the next variant is was just magically gone, you know, um, and, you know, the whole of COVID was just magically gone. I just seriously question whether there is, in, whether there is a giant piece of elastic that pings everything back as it was before. You know, we have been changed by this thing. And we will continue to be different people because of it. Um, and church will be different because of it. And actually, for some of us, you know, if it, I wonder whether church is going to suddenly... You know, if you took it away, I don't think it will magically go back. And that is enormously challenging. We have to think and make sense of how... Not just, not, we don't just survive, although... Uh, a couple of times people said to me recently, what's your vision? Well, at the moment, to be quite frank, just having the building open is a vision. You know, just, just surviving is a vision. Um, that's about, to be quite frank, that's about where I am in terms of vision at the moment, is can we just hang on in there long enough to get through this thing and come out the other end? That's probably where I am with vision at this time. Um, But even when we come out of it, I don't know that we go back. So we have to find a way to go forward. Because if Ephesians tells us anything, it's that church matters. Not an institution, not the Church of England, not St. Matthew's Church specifically, um, not kind of how we've done things whenever we've done them, but church matters because it's at the heart of God's eternal purposes for the world that he made. It's always been in his thinking. It's part of his plan. It's not an optional extra. So it it may be different, but it still is at the heart of what God um, is about. Uh, And this book has a lot to say about personal salvation, 
but actually it's very much couched in what it means in terms of personal salvation, bringing us not just into relationship with Jesus, but bringing us into relationship with others who share the faith that we have and the significance of us being united as a people that follow Jesus. Um, and this passage is just that, I mean, Mark's comment to me was, you know, you could preach for a month and still not kind of get to the bottom of this passage. You could preach a sermon on almost every verse. To be quite frank, you could, pre- you could pretty much preach a sermon on every word in this opening chapter because it, it feels like every single one of them is pregnant with meaning. They're just full of meaning. And I'm going to be glossing over it, so I grovel now. Um, but this is kind of like this massive invitation that sets the theological kind of scene for what's going to follow in this book. Uh, and Paul is reminding them of what God has done for them. It's not just what God has done for them, it's what God has done for us. Um, they have been, we have been, blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ. You know, when life is crap, it doesn't feel like that, does it? But it, doesn't, but it hasn't changed. God has given us every spiritual blessing in Christ. Uh, we are chosen. Isn't that the most precious thing? You are not some sort of mistake that slipped in here by accident and, um, oh, I just happened to be there and I'm not really sure that God really wanted me. No, God chose you. He says even he chose you even before the beginning of the world. Even when the world was created, you were in his mind. You're not kind of some sort of accident or mistake. We're adopted. I'm going to say more about that in a moment. We are redeemed. We've been brought back from everything that damages and warps and destroys our lives. God's in the business of setting us free from it. Um, We're forgiven. We don't have to carry around the rubbish of our lives on our shoulders. We get to lay it at the foot of the cross And we get to walk away and leave it there and begin again. And because of that, when God sees us, he sees us as blameless. Um, Most of the time I feel guilty about pretty much everything. Am I alone in that? Um, You know, if it goes wrong, generally speaking, I will feel somehow it is my fault. Um, And probably the whole of COVID is my fault. I don't know how I did that, but you know, it, it, but... There is that just kind of sense of, I should have done better, you know? Uh, and I'm, I'm, I don't know whether you have those sorts of emotions, you know? We're blameless. God doesn't want us to live with that guilt and that reproach. We're included in Christ. That's why kind of church is at the heart of this. You know, it's not just you're included in Christ or I'm included in Christ. We're all included in Christ. We're all part of one body in Christ. We can't kind of do this thing on our own. And kind of the greatest sign of this, the thing that makes us go, oh yes, when we're worshipping. The thing that pops into our head when we kind of, when a God moment happens is that he sealed us with the precious gift of his spirit, that kind of foretaste of eternity, that he come, that we don't have to wait to live with him in eternity, he comes and lives with us first. Uh, these are just incredible little things. And all of this, Paul tells us, is because of God's grace. We don't deserve any of it. It's not because we've earned it, it's not because we've got X number of bounty points, we've got all these things given to us. We get it because he loves us, because he sent his son, because his son died on the cross in our place. None of it's deserved. And often when we talk about these things, we talk in terms of personal faith, about putting our trust in Jesus. And in Ephesians, everything that Paul says about the individual is true for us. This is what God has done for us as individuals. But it's also couched in terms of its relevance for the church. And I'm just going to pick out a couple of examples. I mentioned I'd say a little bit more about what it means to be adopted. We're adopted as sons. Please, ladies, do not switch off. This is legal. This is the culture in which Paul lived 
in which only men could receive inheritance and hold property. He's addressing men and women and saying that you've got all the rights of sonship. You know, there's no division. It's for all of you. We've been, we've been given, we've been, we've been adopted into sonship. Uh, in the New Testament, adoption is an incredibly important spiritual concept. It means that when we put our trust in Jesus, we get Jesus' inheritance. Everything that all, he takes all of our rubbish, that's what the cross is about, he carries our sin, but that's not the end of the transaction. He gives us everything that is his. His relationship with the Father, his holiness, um, his eternal life, all, everything that he has, his inheritance becomes our inheritance. His relationship with God the Father becomes our relationship with God the Father. Paul says in Romans, we are joint heirs with Christ. What's his is ours. And we're invited to share in that. And that is a massive theological thing, that when God looks at us, you know, when we look in the mirror, we see all the warts. But when God looks at us, he sees Jesus and the holiness and the glory of his son because that's how we are in his sight. We've been made blameless and pure and holy and there's no barrier anymore. And it's the most, you know, the, the, to plumb the depths of that kind of spiritually, you, you could almost kind of unpack the whole Bible really. But we didn't ought to overlook the practical implications of adoption. When we're adopted, we become God's child. And, and, yeah, and I know you know that, but just take hold of that for a moment. That when you put your trust in Jesus, you become God's child. That's for you. You become his child. You are adopted into his family. You have the inheritance that is Jesus's. It's yours. But if I've become God's child and you've become God's child, what does that make us? It makes us family. You know? Could you imagine being a parent um, and having children? One of the, the most precious things at the moment for me is kind of, am I allowed to, it's, my daughter's in the room, which is a very dangerous thing, really. Um, I, I can remember bringing up two children that I thought hated each other. My son delighted in kicking his sister under the table at every single meal time. Um, and then she would squawk and try and kick him back and do a pretty miserable job of inflicting any sort of pain on Daniel. And then, generally speaking, having Daniel having started it, I would then tur turn around and tell Karis off because she was the one that made the noise and disrupted my dinner. And so she is a very long-suffering daughter. And as a, as a result of that, I could understand why she would never want to speak to her brother again. But just one of the delights for Carol and I is the fact that not just do, do we enjoy our kids, but is seeing how much our kids enjoy each other. And that is a precious thing. Um, and um, could you imagine being in a family where you love your kids and you've got a relationship, but your kids don't want to know each other? And it's horrific, isn't it? And it, unfortunately it happens, and it's painful and it's hurtful. Could you imagine how God would feel if that was us? We want a relationship with him, but stuff everybody else. You can't do that, can you? That's why church is unavoidable. If we are connected to, to God, then we're connected to each other. And that, I'm aware, I did tell everyone, I've only got to speak for 15 minutes and I'm about to go over that. The second thing I just really want to pick out is that we are united in Christ. 
And that is what Paul says is the great mystery. I, kind of, I felt I wanted to give this whole thing a title. And the title doesn't really work, but it sounds cool. I thought I'd take it from the Beatles song, Magical Mystery Tour. Um, because this concept of mystery keeps popping up in this letter. Paul uses it on lots of occasions. And he uses mystery in a very, very specific way in Ephesians. Now, um, today would be the first Sunday of Epiphany. Uh, It's the Sunday when we celebrate the manifestation of Christ to the Gentiles. And that gives us a bit of a clue about this whole concept of mystery. Uh, When we celebrate Epiphany, we're celebrating the fact that in the wise men, in the Magi, God kind of gave us a little bit of a window on his future plans. That Jesus wasn't just for the Jews, but Jesus was for everybody, for us. And those magi, wise men, wise women, whoever they were, were like a foretaste of everyone getting Jesus. Um, And kind of, it's like this was something that God always planned... He always planned to send Jesus. He always planned the cross. He always planned to restore us to himself through Jesus' death on the cross. It was part of God's plans for eternity, but it was hidden for eternity. The prophets knew he was going to do something. They knew he would send a Messiah. They kind of, but they never really quite understood how it would all work out. It was kind of, it was shrouded in mystery and it was kept hidden until the coming of Jesus and the death of Jesus and the pouring out of Jesus. And it's at that point the the shutters are taken off, the scales fall away and people see the reality that God had a plan and that plan was for the whole of humanity. Um, And so often in the New Testament when it talks about mystery, it talks about that aspect of God's purpose, how God was going to save us being a hidden thing that was only revealed when the time was right, when Jesus came. Paul takes it one step further. In this book, he talks about mystery in a slightly deeper way. He talks about it not just in God's act of salvation being hidden, but he talks about it, uh, about the, the result of that act being hidden. And the result of that act is, first, that we're restored to relationship with Jesus, but the bit that was really hidden, the bit he talk, when he talks about mystery here, he's talking about, and that's why this book is so significant, is the thing that was really hidden is that through Jesus, God planned to unite everybody, the whole of humanity. We live in the most broken and fractured world I can possibly imagine, whether it is nation turning on nation, race turning on race, ethnicity against ethnicity, on issues of gender, sexuality, colour, everything. We live in the most divided world. The biggest division for the Jew was, we're Jewish and everyone else isn't. That was what divided their world. And Paul's saying, but in Jesus, the division is gone. You've been united in him. That's the ultimate mystery. God plans to unite everybody in his son. And at the heart of that is church. And that's why it matters. And that's what we're going to be unpacking this term. And the token of that is he's placed his spirit in us that connects us to him because he lives in us, but also connects us to each other because that spirit lives in each of us. Mark, come and pray for us.